Ready? All right. Welcome, everybody, to the SSP uh, Wednesday seminar series. Uh, before we get going, there's a, a big announcement I want to make, and that's that our own uh, real leader, Laura Kerwin, has won the Infinite Mile Award for service to the Institute. Well, well deserved. You keep us all in line, Laura, and you do go beyond the, the norms. So uh, so I'm Roger Peterson. I'm the acting director filling in for Taylor Frable, who's on leave this year. And we're lucky to have Stephanie Schwartz with us, who's flown in from London. Uh, Professor Schwartz has worked with international policy organizations, including the uh, US Institute of Peace, the World Bank, and the Sud Institute. She was awarded the 2019 Best Dissertation Award from the Migration and Citizenship section of the APSA and uh, won the inaugural Emerging Global Scholar Prize from the Perry World House at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science from Columbia University and then a BA from West Point. Uh, today, or she, she's uh, finished a book project, or almost finished, um, a Homeward Bound, Refugee Return and Local Conflict After Civil War, which examines how refugee returns influence future patterns of conflict and displacement. But your talk today is on, on uh, another, another related but different project, which um, is refugee return. And I don't, I can't know any French words. Barry, you know all the French, right? So this is... That's the one. There it is. Refugee return without that. <laughs> and a typology of state strategies to evade asylum norms. So, Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here um, and sharing a project that is hopefully the new book project, hopefully sort of the conceptual foundation for a new project. Um, but it's at a good time to receive feedback. Uh, so I'm looking forward to, to all, your, all your help in um, making sure that we can all pronounce French by the time that we, we leave here today. Um, and it has been influenced by uh, my previous work in Tanzania and Burundi, working with uh, refugees who were returning and seeing how that created sort of new sources of conflict in their countries of origin and eventually leading to people fleeing again, such that return was never really the durable solution that it was framed to be, right? Um, and at the same time, a lot of these people were returning they, out of coercion. Um, they didn't necessarily want to return, and that coercion was stemming from states. And so I became really interested in, if this isn't really a solution, why are we seeing so much coerced return? Um, and so that's where we get uh, here today for a refugee return without reforma. Um, and it also stems from a debate in the asylum world about whether we are currently witnessing the end of asylum. Over in my part of the world um, with Rishi Sunak, the Prime Minister of the UK, there has been a hotly contested Rwanda plan to try and force asylum seekers who come to the UK um, to send them back to, or send them not back to, send them to Rwanda to assess their asylum obligations, right? Um, and even uh, not just from the Trump administration, but we also have Biden administration trying to increase asylum restrictions, right? And it's sort of conventional wisdom 
among migration scholars that rich democracies are insulating themselves from ever having to provide asylum. Um, but they're doing this uh, without violating international law, right? And that's because there is no right to asylum under international law. We have a right to seek asylum, so all of those signs had to be corrected at protests. There is no international right to asylum, you have a right to seek asylum. And then the sort of foundation of the asylum regime as we know it, know it is, and this is like the one thing that you take away from today will be what non-refoulement is. Um, non-refoulement is this prohibition, this international legal prohibition against returning someone who would qualify as a refugee to a place where their life or liberty are in danger. And the key word there being return. So it really only applies once refugees reach a state's territory. We can debate what territory means, whether that's the frontier, whether that's jurisdiction. But the idea is once they've reached a place, you cannot send them back, non-refoulement. And so policies like the Rwanda plan are meant to prevent people from ever reaching a state's territory. But at the same time, we're seeing a lot of coerced return, what I was seeing in Tanzania. But in 2019, uh, Erwan's plan, uh, his sort of 2019 incursion into Syria was in part motivated, he said quite publicly, in order to create a safe zone to which he could return some of the Syrian refugees living in Turkey. Kenya regularly threatens to close Dadaab refugee camp, right, and return uh, uh, refugees to Somalia and actively works with the UN to pay refugees to return. And then um, probably the most recent that you might have seen this year is uh, Pakistan's coerced return of Afghans living, or Afghan who they called undocumented migrants, many of whom would qualify as refugees living in Pakistan. So the question sort of becomes how are states coercing refugee return without paying any reputational costs for violating non-refoulement. And I should mention at the top that non-refoulement not, is not just any old international law. It is arguably, it, it's definitely customary international law, meaning that it applies to all states, regardless of whether they've signed the 1951 Convention on Refugees. But some argue that it's just Kogan's. Did you have a question? Um, that it is sort of a preemptory norm. It is so essential to our moral fabric as an international community that is a norm from which no state can derogate. And that's because it evolved out of World War II and it evolved out of many states um, turning away uh, Jewish refugees fleeing Germany, right? Um, and sending them back to perish. And so it really is quite a question then how states are coercing this kind of return seemingly in violation of non refoulement and the question then becomes, are these asylum norms dying? And as a preview of my argument, I'm gonna say no. I'm gonna say that non refoulement actually remains strong, but it does so with really perverse outcomes. And that what we actually see is states taking really costly action to technically comply with, with the law without upholding the spirit. And that this isn't just the exclusive purview of rich democracies, this is sort of an important part, that the global south, states in the global south can actually and are doing this as well. We just have to look to the governance of refugee return to see it, rather than the sort of prevention that we're seeing with the Rwanda policy and others. And then finally I come to the conclusion that when we have both the global north and the global south engaging in widespread norm evasion, what we begin to see is a hollowing out of an international human rights regime, where the key institutions, non-refoulement, remain strong, both in terms of compliance and in terms of how, um, uh, how well states agree with the idea of it in spirit. But the actual provision of rights is eroded. So what I'm gonna do for the rest of today is I've gone through the puzzle a bit. Uh, I'm gonna walk through some of the compliance um, literature and how it applies to the refugee regime. Um, just, just a note for those of you um, uh, who are international legal experts in the audience. Um, this is an, uh, a framing that I'm still building in terms of this project, so I really welcome your comments on that. And then the primary sort of analytical framework for this piece is a new typology of asylum norm evasion strategies. And I introduce a third strategy that I call return without refoulement meaning that states try to return refugees without violating 
non-refoulement or the, the no return clause. Um, in the paper, I sort of do a proof of concept case study of uh, Tanzania and Burundi's use of non uh, return without refoulement um, between 2017 up till today, and then I'll talk through the implications. All right, so the big sort of question here, given you know, all of these actions taken seemingly in violation of the spirit of the norm of asylum, is are we seeing norm decay? Are we seeing the end of asylum as we know it? And some scholars have argued that yes, what we are seeing is the end of the asylum regime as it was set up in 1951 um, through the Convention on Refugees. Um, others argue that we should be thinking a little bit um, more uh, uh, tangentially about how norms affect state behavior. And that actually we need to have an analytical distinction between compliance with non refoulement and strength. And this is because we know that states can technically comply with the spirit of a norm, or with the, the legality of a norm while evading its spirit. Um, we can also see um, quasi-compliance with refugees. This is Kate Cronin Furman's work, where you see states sort of establishing, taking costly measures to build human rights accountability regimes to not provide accountability for human rights. Um, or we might see substitution where you have uh, compliance with one aspect of a human rights regime um, sort of substituted with other repressive actions, right? So rather than thinking about compliance or norm strength or weakness, we should be thinking about the strength of human rights norms in terms of how they shape state behavior. Um, and so on the one hand, we have this framework to think about norm strength. And on the other, we have a migration literature that has a very, what I've learned is conventional wisdom in the migration world, but not necessarily in the rest of the world. So I'm going to walk everyone through it. And the idea is that rich democracies can legally evade their asylum obligations, right? And they do this by preventing refugees from reaching their borders. This is not new. Australia has been doing it for a very long time. But the conventional wisdom then is that states in the global south have no choice but to host refugees, right? This is because uh, states in the global south often share a border, right, with migration sending states or refugee sending states, right? And so you don't have that distance um, separated where you can prevent people from reaching your territory, right? And without that distance and with the often, often much more rapid um, uh, movement across a border, um, it's much harder to prevent non refoulement from being triggered, right? Um, and this conventional wisdom is sort of underlying the ways in which international organizations are trying to reform the refugee system. It underlines the global compact on refugees, this idea that we need to promote responsibility sharing between the rich democracies and uh, the states in the South who have no choice but to host refugees. That said, we know that state responses in the global South are far more strategic than we're giving them credit for. Um, there's some really interesting work by Kelsey Norman and Lamise Abdelati and Nora Stell on identifying strategies such as strategic indifference or delegation or ambiguity in asylum law in the ways that states in global South respond to uh, asylum seeking. And we also know from uh, Kelly and others that um, there's a whole world in which migration is used as a form of diplomacy, right? For strategic ends that might not even be related to the migration itself, right? Um, so I'm gonna argue that given all this, to understand the, coerced, uh, the coercion that we're seeing, why we're seeing it and how it functions, we need to have a little bit of reference to how migration actually functions in the global south. A lot of our conventional wisdom is based from observing how asylum functions in America, how asylum functions in Europe. It functions a lot differently in the global south. And I should mention that 80% of refugees also live in the global south, right? Um, and so, Namely, the process of maintaining and, or sort of gaining and maintaining refuge in the global south is very, very different. If you're an asylum seeker who comes to the United States, 
you're gonna, your asylum case is gonna be evaluated on a case-by-case -case individual basis. You, no matter if you came with hundreds of other people who are fleeing the same situation, you as an individual have to demonstrate your qualification as a refugee. This is called individual refugee status determination. And it is much easier, you can imagine, to use an individual case-by-case -case, uh, uh, analysis of your qualifications for refugees to turn certain asylum cases down, right? It can be used as a tool to preclude certain people from entering. It's a lot easier to use also when you don't have hundreds of people or even tens of thousands of people crossing the border at the same time. And it takes a lot of institutional investment. When states in the global north have mass rapid movement across a border, what we tend to see is their upholding of non refoulement without providing refugee status in a form that's called temporary protected status. In the US, um, this can be applied to folks who would qualify as refugees and also folks who would not qualify as refugees. So we see this with um, Haiti, with El Salvador. Most recently where we see this is actually in the European Union with Ukrainian refugees. Unlike what you might assume from the news, Ukrainian refugees in the EU are not technically, uh, do not have refugee status. They have a temporary protected status that is subject to renewal, but they're not being sent home. But this is important. It's not official refugee protected status, in part because in rich democracies, and especially when you go through an individual RSD process, you're put you're generally put on a pathway towards permanent residency. Even if the situation um, in your home country changes such that it's safe to go home, essentially once you have refugee status, you're uh, on a pathway equivalent to a green card where you can stay permanently, right? And the assumption is that you will stay permanently. In the global south, it operates on a in much different way. You have mass rapid movement, thousands of people moving across a border in Sudan into Chad right now, tens of thousands of people moving across a border, it becomes sort of um, uh, inefficient, bureaucratically speaking, to individually evaluate um, every refugee who comes through. And instead, a lot of these countries will allow will a sort of, it's not technically a group. But I don't feel like I have any lawyers in the room who are going to like ding me on this. So we'll call it a group um, refugee status determination process where anybody coming from Sudan is considered at face value, prima facie, to qualify for refugee status. And it expedites it such that you don't have this long asylum-seeking claims process where you have an individual who might be waiting months or even years for their individual status. You cross a border, you're a refugee. And it's en masse. And what we see, so this is, <clears throat> Newly recognized refugees in the global north, you'll notice on, on a whole, it's far less than in the global south. And this red line here shows that most refugees in the global north through to 2020 received individual status determination. Um, this uh, temporary protected status in 2015 um, <clears throat> comes up, bounces up for Syria in uh, the EU, um, but really, most people in the global north have individual refugee status determination. Most people in the global south have either prima facie refugee status determination or temporary protected status, which I can talk about in the Q&A, is basically UNHCR not knowing how for its lawyers to categorize de facto prima facie recognition, group recognition where a government doesn't want to use the term refugee. And these spikes here are for um, Syrians living in um, Lebanon and, other, and Jordan. And so we see that most refugees in the global south are basically almost immediately given some form of refugee-like status. So that's one thing we need to take into account. Yeah. Uh, Refugee-location individuals in the global south um, are also on the track of becoming like permanent residents in those countries. Thank you for asking this question. No. Um, most people who are recognized prima facie actually live in long-term legal precarity. They are not put on a pathway to permanent residence. Um, some legal scholars argue, and um, I would push it further to say that this is basically a form 
of temporary protected status, long-term temporary protected status. Um, but in general, this is where you see um, the creation of large camps where you have refugees living for decades, right, in camps without permanent residency rights. It's an important distinction. Thank you for bringing it up. The second thing I'm going to argue that is important is that something that we can forget is that the asylum sh regime, the sort of global asylum and refugee protection sh regime, is not just non-refoulement. Non-refoulement is the cornerstone on which the way that we, that we, asylum functions today, it would not function. But that is just one, that's Article 33 in dozens of other of, of articles in the Refugee Convention, let alone all the regional treaty bodies and such that are meant to shape state behavior towards refugees and asylum seekers. And a lot of what the Refugee Convention includes beyond non refoulement are standards of treatment for refugees in country. How states are supposed to uphold refugees' access to labor, refugees' access to work, to health care, um, to um, civ civil liberties while they're in country, right? And that if we remember back to the world of compliance and norm strength, right, we, should, we may expect to see states upholding non refoulement but then violating other aspects of the normative regime. And that's exactly what I argue. I argue that states in the global south can also evade asylum norms, um, but they must do so creatively once refugees are already on their territory. And one of the ways that they're able to do this is that the singular focus on non refoulement from the activist community and from other states within the regime makes it easier for them to substitute with other repressive behaviors. And then through the typology, we're going to see that this is worldwide. And what does that worldwide then norm evasion mean for asylum as we know it? So this is where I move into um, not your traditional political science setup. Um, as a conceptual paper, um, what I've tried to do is um, provide a, a, syn a synthetic and typological argument. Um, using descriptive uh, examples to illustrate the typology and then a proof of concept case study for this idea of return without refoulement as a strategy. And so I'll walk you through that just a bit. So I start with a sort of a decision tree for um, state choices of how they're going to comply in response to asylum seeking. So you can choose to not comply and refuse entry to altogether to refugees or even deport refugees. You can choose to comply and provide asylum and simply just host refugees, right? I would argue that most folks, though, are looking at strategies that comply with non refoulement but then try and avoid their asylum obligations. The ones that are studied in the literature, this so-called non-entree regime and non-recognition, which I'll get into, are primarily used in the global north with a few hints here and there in the global south. And so, what is non-entree? More French, less important than non-refoulement. Um, but it speaks to the fact that this strategy applies as refugees are trying to enter a country, right? Because if we remember, non-refoulement, those protections only apply once you reach the territory of a country. And so you can develop strategies to prevent asylum seekers from reaching a border or to require refugees to remain offshore while assessing their asylum claim, right? This is sort of uh, uh, Australia was a real entrepreneur in this strategy um, and has, which is being picked up um, in the United States and the EU and all over. Because if you can deny those asylum claims or delay those asylum claims, you can send people back because they're not on your territory. The second I are sort of a group of strategies that are emerging in the literature that I've grouped together in the typology under the phase of non-recognition. And this is the idea being that it's, refugees have already approached the border, but we're going to try and avoid initial recognition. We're going to try and just avoid recognizing that these people are refugees. So we can delay asylum decisions. We can refuse to engage with displaced populations. We can call Afghan uh, refugees undocumented migrants and deport them, right? So trying to avoid recognizing them as refugees. 
most of these tactics are about sort of precluding, delaying, denying. It is much easier to do this um, in the global north where you have the bureaucratic institutions to do so. It takes a lot of investment. Um, we are seeing it in the global south as well. Um, but there's sort of an assumption that as much as you can preclude, delay, or deny, you still have to host those refugees if they're on your territory. Um, and you can't preclude, delay, or deny someone who is recognized prima facie because that's the whole, that's the whole shebang. They've, they've been recognized, right? So what you have to do is find a way to return refugees who are already recognized on your territory. This should not be possible under non reforma I argue that states are able to do this by essentially turning already recognized refugees into asylum seekers all over again, and then violating all these other parts of the refugee regime in an attempt to coerce refugees to return voluntarily. So that I argue there's this third option called return without reforma, primarily used in the global south, though you know Germany is, is hopping in there trying to return Syrians as well. So the, which is to say that these tactics can be used uh, worldwide, but this is where we're primarily seeing them. So what is the goal of return without reforma as a strategy? Like I said, it is to stop hosting already recognized refugees on your territory. And to do so, sort of using at least under a veil of legitimacy, right? If I wanted to just return already recognized refugees on my territory, I could deport them. Um, I could kidnap them and send them to another country. Um, but return without reforma is trying to do so sort of under a guise of legality. Why do this? Host states might have a lot of incentives to do this, right? Particularly in the global south, where they are beholden to um, an international community for um, foreign aid or for um, money to uphold all of that refugee regime. They want to sort of stay in the good graces of the international regime, but they may have domestic incentives, um, whether it's xenophobia or um, other domestic incentives, to stop hosting refugees, right? Um, the same way that, you know, we experience that in, in wherever we live. Like, there are, are plenty of domestic incentives um, not to continue to host refugees. But I also argue that this is not just um, the host state who might be interested in return. And this is sort of from my experience in Burundi, where this came out as sort of, it could be actually a mutually beneficial form of migration diplomacy, in that origin states have an interest in refugees returning to their territory. Seems counterintuitive. Uh, we're persecuting these people, right? The, uh, but most often, these states that are sending mass populations of refugees out onto somebody else's soil are in a bit of a PR bind in the international community. They may even be subject to various human rights investigations, sanctions, all of these things. Um, but if you can say, hey, thousands of refugees are returning to our territory, everything is fine here. They wouldn't return if it wasn't fine and dandy here. It's a really useful PR tool to avoid the scrutiny of the international community. So then you, you arguably have sort of like a mutually beneficial incentive to use return without reforma. And not only that, if the host country or if the origin country is saying, refugees are returning because everything is fine and dandy, oh, that works for the host country's favor. Because if everything is safe in the country of origin, returning is not violating non reforma because we're not sending people to places where it's dangerous. We're sending them somewhere that it's safe. And then finally, international organizations are also in on this. UNHCR, the UN rebranded UN Refugee Agency, former the High Commissioner for Refugees, um, has you know, evolved as an organization itself, right? It not only looks at monitoring of the refugee regime, but they also provide asylum. And they are beholden to states to function. And if states want to return refugees, 
they have an incentive to cater to that. And so Michael Barnett has really interesting case studies of how UNHCR has evolved their sort of definition of what counts as voluntary, sort of eating away at that to become, um, to have an interest in promoting refugee return and calling it voluntary, even if it's not truly voluntary. So this is sort of the strategy that I'm introducing in the paper. Um, how do they do it? Um, there are a couple of tactics that are common, um, not just in the case study that I'll present, but um, worldwide. So the first, and why have I been talking about all these French words, is to end prima facie recognition. So ending group recognition, what does that do? If you stop recognizing, if you stop saying, we don't need to recognize people who are coming from Burundi, as refugees anymore, because on face value, they may no longer qualify for refugee status, you're laying the groundwork to say that this population is no longer in need of international protection. So first thing you do is you end prima facie recognition. Anyone else who comes in has to come in as an individual asylum seeker. The next thing you might do is threaten to cease refugee status. Again, the 1951 convention doesn't just have non refoulement it also has a clause that says under what conditions you can end refugee status. If you'll remember in the Global North from our question, refugees are put on a permanent pathway towards residency. Um, the cessation clause is rarely invoked. But if there has been sort of substantial improvement in the conditions of the country of origin, there is a legal way to cease refugee status and send refugees back, and it's no longer refoulement because it's safe at home. Nobody knows what the legal process is for cessation. UNHCR has some recommendations. It's fairly opaque, right? But states can start talking about status cessation. They can start saying, we may be moving towards status cessation. cessation. They can start sort of uh, laying the groundwork for under what um, sort of conditions they're citing as the reasons for potential status cessation. And in the end, they can actually fully move towards legal status cessation, where they say anyone who's recognized prima facie, you are no longer have refugee status. You may individually apply as asylum seekers. So I'm gonna turn all the recognized refugees on my territory into asylum seekers again, recreating that point of entrance and recognition. And the 250,000 of you who are living here, each and every one of you has to prove your individual case of persecution for why you deserve to stay and need international protection. And then I can legally deport everyone else. In the meantime, as this might be a long process, uh, we're gonna violate every as other aspect of the refugee regime. We're gonna make it a terrible place for you to live. We're gonna use various coercive, um, strategies to over-police, to restrict your access to markets, restrict your access to the economy, make it an uncomfortable place for you to stay and put you under pressure to leave. We may even offer positive incentives. We might not have the money to do so, but the UN does. And we'll ask the UN to give you a package to resettle and return home. In Somalia, or sorry, in Kenya they've done this, and the UN actually forced uh, returnees to sign a document saying that they would cede their right to reclaim refugee status again in the future, which is like not, a, not allowed, <laughs> right? Um, so it's not just the sort of hostile living conditions, but you can also incent positively incentivize so-called voluntary return. So I argue that this return without refoulement strategy is exactly what we're seeing in Tanzania today. Um, Tanzania also used many of these strategies in 2009, forcing people to return the Burundians who I interviewed um, in my previous return project. So what's going on in Tanzania today? I think I still have a bit of time. Yeah. Yep. So just as a quick background for those of you who may not know uh, or have heard of Burundi or know where it is, uh, Burundi is a neighbor to Rwanda uh, in uh, Eastern Central Africa in the Great Lakes region. And in 2015, um, they had a massive electoral crisis. Um, the president, you know, he had um, wanted to run for an illegal third term. Turns out the public doesn't like that. There were mass protests and then mass repression of those protests by the president. 
And this coincided with hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing Burundi, including into Tanzania. Tanzania was initially welcoming, um, recognized Burundians prima facie. Um, but this came on the heels of um, a 2010 a uh, declaration by the ruling party in Tanzania that they were going to make Tanzania refugee free. That was sort of the, the promise, was that we have been hosting the world's refugees on behalf of the global north, and we're done with it. Um, we hosted Rwandans. We're done with it. We continue to host Congolese. We're done with it. And they had sort of come to power in part on this platform to end refugee hosting, in part. Um, by 2017, the crisis in Burundi is ongoing, um, but they've learned from their neighbor, Rwanda. What they've learned is that you've got to hide your repression a bit better. Um, and so they are still targeting people who opposed the, the 2015 electoral crisis. They're still targeting political opponents, but they're doing so in a way that is much more hidden from the international community, right? Because also the international community is now investigating human rights violations in Burundi. And so Burundi has an incentive here to try and sort of get the international community off their back. So what happens? In 2017, um, Tanzania announces that they are going to end prima facie recognition of Burundians. The Burundians who are crossing the border, they say to me and to others, are no longer in need of international protection, they're just hungry. Hunger doesn't qualify you for refugee status, right? These aren't refugees anymore, and so we're gonna end prima facie recognition. Then in 2019, it's revealed that Tanzania and Burundi have signed a secret agreement to orchestrate the return of Burundian refugees together. Voluntarily in the ideal, but the document says explicitly that if Burundians don't return voluntarily, they will, they will force them. And they're going to push UNHCR to coordinate those returns in order to provide some legitimacy to this coercion. And so what's been happening from 2019 to present is that Tanzania has orchestrated plans to close all the refugee camps housing Burundian refugees. They've been talking about it for, for four years now, and slowly, slowly, slowly reducing the areas and camps um, where Burundians are allowed to live. They have closed market access to Burundians in camps. The Congolese in the same camps, they can access uh, markets, but not the Burundians. We were, uh, a colleague of mine and I were talking with um, uh, someone in one of the Burundian refugee camps who's working with an NGO who said that the NGOs are no longer allowed to provide biscuits to Burundians who come to their workshops. They're hosting these gender violence uh, um, workshops and the Congolese can get cookies and tea at the workshops, but the Burundians are not allowed, right? They're slowly creating every form of a hostile living condition that they can. Um, they are also pressuring UNHCR to be to sort of begin thinking about preparing for this full reevaluation of uh, Burundian refugee status, that the sort of um, announcing that soon when they close the camps, they're gonna cease Burundian refugee status and they're gonna require everyone to demonstrate their individual asylum case anew. What's Burundi been doing? Well, Burundi, has been going before the UN General Assembly and announcing the number of refugees returned on their soil. End your human rights investigation. This is neo-colonialism at its finest because clearly it's peaceful in Burundi because all of these refugees are returning. Um, and then what's UNHCR doing? Um, they're facilitating it, right? So, they have stated it's not safe in Burundi for refugees to return, but that they will always facilitate truly voluntary return. One of the reasons they say this is back to sort of the constellation of norms that I was talking about. In addition to non refoulement individual refugees have a right to return. The right to return is meant to be one of the most important human rights laws for migrants, right? 
Um, and in most places, uh, it is heated. And UNHCR, in most places, takes it very seriously. And so they want to help anyone who truly voluntarily wants to return. They will help them return. Um, and they are providing return packages for any return returnees who do want to return to Burundi. Even if that want to return is because the markets have been closed, they cannot, you know, um, uh, have a livelihood for their families, um, they're being over-policed by the Burundians, it's tr truly voluntary. The other thing is that they're really hesitant to pressure Tanzania, um, because Tanzania, several years ago, naturalized some Burundian refugees who were living on their soil for since 1972. Um, it's one of the only sort of mass naturalization uh, uh, programs in recent history. Um, and because Tanzania did this, um, they're sort of trading on an actor, uh, tr they're trading on a sort of reputation as a good actor in the system. And UNHCR has said, even though this was happening in 2015, 2018, they have said years later, well, they naturalized that other group. So we don't want to pressure them on these other things right now. Um, and they're continuing to assist this voluntary repatriation. Every so often they post um, something on their, uh, you know, a press release with how many Burundians have returned. So what would we expect to see if this was something besides return without reforma? I argue that all of the action that we've taken, that we're seeing being taken, the length of time it is taking, is that we would see it would be much easier to um, just deport the refugees without this fuss about ending status, without sort of telegraphing, we're going to close the camp soon, we're going to close the camp soon, without all the fuss about, um, you know, preventing access to market, they could just deport refugees. But they're not doing that. They could formally cease the status based on objective change circumstances in Burundi. But they can't really get away with that. And they're not doing that. They're just telegraphing that we think circumstances are improving. Um, but, circ the, but sort of it hasn't been objective. There hasn't been an objective increase in the human rights situation that would make it safe for refugees to return. And instead, what I argue we're seeing is sort of costly, costly lengthy action to feign compliance with non refoulement um, violating these others norm, other norms in the regime to try and en masse coerce refugee return. Another explanation could be that this is truly voluntary return. And we shouldn't sort of forget that's important. And for those who do want to return truly voluntarily, um, that it is their right to do so. And it's important to protect that right. That said, arguably, these states are influencing the choice set, right? When you don't have access to a job to provide for your family, when you're being told you may not live in this camp uh, for much longer, but we're not going to tell you when you're going to move, but you're going to have to move at a moment's notice, it, you're put under pressure, right? Alex Braithwaite and others have a really interesting article on this, on the sort of psychic pressure that refugees feel, right, in these cases, and what that do, does in terms of their decision making on whether they want to return. So I argue that we're not seeing a ton of truly voluntary return and that we need to be thinking about how states are actually influencing that decision. So what does all this mean? Are we seeing the end of asylum? So yes and no is what I would argue. I think that sort of what the typology demonstrates bringing together the sort of well-known tactics used in the global north with what I'm identifying as a tactic used in the global south suggests that norm evasion of non-refoulement is widespread. It is global, right? Um, but what that means is that globally, states are attempting to comply with the sort of cornerstone or what is seen as the cornerstone of the regime without actually providing human rights, right? So we're seeing continued strength of one aspect of the regime and a hollowing out of the actual provision of rights. And in particular, we're seeing increased precarity for the living conditions of the 80% of refugees who live in the global south. Those 80% of refugees who are recognized prima facie 
who it's much easier to violate all the standards of treatments of how they are meant to have their rights respected in country. So even if we're not seeing them returning, their quality of asylum, their quality of refuge is degraded. Um, importantly, I argue that the, eh, that's not the exclusive purview of the global north, sorry. Um, adding, adding slides on the plane. Um, this is important because, so there's sort of new research um, that came out that suggests that asylum policy in the global south is more liberal in, than in the global north and has gotten more liberal over time. Um, and I argue that actually, no, that's not the case, that states in the global south can manipulate liberal asylum law towards illiberal ends. They just have to use other ways to do so, ways that we might not recognize based on our asylum system in the global north. And then finally, this has real policy world implications because it suggests that you know, the central pathology of the refugee regime might not just be about the disproportionate refugee hosting between the global north and the global south. But actually, we might need to be thinking about how to protect those 80% of refugees living in the global south in increased precarity. And it also suggests, sort of back to the beginning <clears throat> where I started, that this idea that voluntary return is the preferred durable solution to refugee crises, that voluntary return might neither be sort of um, preferred or durable or a solution. And we may need to rethink how we go about thinking about the durability of solutions, um, particularly around return. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, and thank you, Kelly. You might have something to say on this. Sure. No. Uh, I think you need to say, as Stephanie knows, I have to leave early, so definitely I'll get that line. But um, you'll be probably unsurprised. I'm even more cynical than you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, chew on this for a bit. I would argue that asylum is disappearing, mm. and what we're in, we're seeing is a replacement, like lip service to the idea mm. of non-reformal, because. Basically, I mean, you told an extraordinary story, but it strikes me that the story is saying, we're, we're done, we just want to look like we're not done. Mm. So we'll do, it, we'll do whatever we can to avoid hypocrisy costs um, until the circumstances change whereby we're not even going to experience hypocrisy mm. costs here. Um, so it's a giant PR campaign in the midst of destroying this island. Mm all the while narrowing the definition of who's a refugee and so on and so forth, all the stuff you're familiar with. So tell me why I'm wrong and why we should feel better <laughs> about the future of this island. Well, this is going to sound uh, uh, hypocritical coming from me a bit, but you're wrong because we're still hosting refugees, right? So these efforts to return, they are long, and as, as I've been told in other seminars, largely unsuccessful in um, returning all of those refugees, right? So we're still seeing hosting, we're seeing a lack of like so, sort of the erosion of the quality of asylum, but all state behavior is shaped by non refoulement right? So, 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 like, well, okay, so let me ask it a different way, and then I will move on. What would convince you that I'm not, I'm not saying you should be persuaded, but at, like, at what point in time, like, what's the tipping point that would persuade you that the conventional wisdom is right? So, to say, like, we're, that, mm. that some, that Western democracies, for instance, are still hosting some number of refugees, even though they're making it... Oh, I didn't mean Western no, democracy. No, but I'm saying, yeah. so similar, yeah. so in the global south. So if it becomes more difficult and those who are there are um, confronted with an increasing array of punitive as well as inducement-related incentives to return, yeah. uh, like at what point in time do you say it's over? I mean, I, you know, that, that some people are allowed to stay is, is a reasonable pushback, but it doesn't 
persuade me that the regime itself is. So, uh, so it's under threat as opposed to it's disappeared altogether. So, so when has the regime disappeared altogether? I, I'm saying it's on, I, I think it's under threat and your story oh, okay. doesn't persuade me that this myth that asylum is disappearing is wrong. Like that, that's not a myth. Yes. And you're saying the fact that some refugees are still present yes. is, is, um, well, actually, this is very helpful okay. because I do okay. think it's under threat. I think that the quality of asylum protection is under threat. I think what is happening is that non refoulement is not under threat. Uh, non refoulement continues to shape state behavior. We can talk about it. Even if they're paying lip service, it's pretty costly and they're organizing a lot. Rishi Sunak is paying, paying hundreds of thousands of <laughs> to go on a jet to, to Rwanda in order to do this, right? Most conservative politicians say, and so would Keir Starmer, uh, that they're doing this as part of political theater. Mm. Right? Because they know they're not going to change what's actually happening, but for the electorate, they need to appear. Right. But they're still. So what, but, what I'm saying is that <laughs> asylum as we know it, the we're sort of ignoring, we are seeing an erosion of asylum, but it's everything else in the regime. And everyone is still focused on non refoulement and we should be paying attention to everything else as well. We'll continue to talk about it. I'd, I'd like to just come in on this myself because some of this the discussion of what a regime is and a norm is, these are sort of slippery kinds of things. Mm. There's, there's one idea comes from philosophy of uh, Jan Elster. It's about how norms sustain themselves. And let's, let's imagine a situation that there's a group of, of people. Uh, Elster's point is they have to have second order negative emotions towards the other person's behavior, right? And let's, if you have a group of four people, they go to dinner at different restaurants, and, through, and, and the one, one time it's everybody, they, they share the payment. And one person pays but leaves no tip. It, it's not actually against the interest to leave a tip. and they're not paying that time, but you still leave a tip because the other three people think, what a schmuck for stiffing the weight staff, right? And so the norm is keeps going because you want to avoid that. And one of the questions I think is, is the world reaching with all of these refugee cases emotional to, to actually say this is a bad thing? It won't be there. There won't be the second order sort of negative emotional reactions. And if you don't have that, well, maybe we, we, you know, then the regime will disappear because the norms will disappear. Right. And are we getting to that stage where people don't have that type of reaction? But the, this gets to why is this thing persisting? Because is it in the interest of states or is there just the negative sort of emotions? <coughs> like you can't really break this norm. It's just a non-humanitarian thing to do. Right. I think that the issue here is there has been an remains a conflation between providing asylum and upholding non refoulement And I think there remains some sort of emotional, oh, we can't do that, it violates international law, this really, really important international law that continues to shape state behavior in some way. But we're willing to violate all these other aspects of the regime that involves multiple and overlapping institutions uh, rules, actors, and all of these things. And so I do think the regime itself is changing, right? It's becoming hollow. But it, the fact that, it, that you know, we are still organizing all of these efforts to make life harder for refugees around non refoulement suggests that in some way it has strength in shaping state behavior. I guess that's where I am. Daniel. Yeah, hi, I'm Daniel Siebel, my second year at PhD student department. Um, my question is sort of about like, like what are the strategies of, of refugees? So I think like in your story you're talking about like, what the states the interests are and how they're going about the, the refugee crisis, but like the, the behavior of refugees who are absent. I think refugees are strategic actors, right? Like they don't just go to a place because like, that's their only option. We think a lot about, I mean, at least in the global north context, I've been more familiar with. You know, refugees going to Europe or from Scandinavian countries. <laughs> 
or services. So could you just talk a little about like how you've seen or think refugee strategies would change under these different conditions? Because I think they're an important actor that's not really present in the story right now. Yeah. So I, I agree with you that refugees can, refugees have some agency, right, in where they go. A lot of the times, and we don't see this as much um, with our view in terms of looking at asylum in the global north, in the global south, you're going to the first border that you can cross safely, right? Um, and that safely may be, well, I'm going to go a slightly bit further to go to a country where um, in Burundi, you know, I might circle up a bit to go to Rwanda if I'm Tutsi, and I might circle down a bit to go to Tanzania if I'm Hutu, but really it's the closest border where I can find safety. What we do see in terms of strategic responses for return, we see this a lot in South Sudan, is um, refugees sort of secretly going back and seeing if things are safe enough for them to return and then coming back. Um, so trying to sort of figure out what the, what the actual lay of the land is. Um, but I think what is particularly um, tragic about this situation is that refugees are very much caught in the middle. Um, and the actor that is supposed to be protecting them against the persecution is now actively persecuting them, such that it may be, um, in the short term, wise to get out of Tanzania, for example, because of the, the, the coercive environment that they've been living in. Um, the question then becomes like how much of that is about their own agency versus how much of the choice set is being sort of framed by states. I think part of the problem, for example, with the global compact is that refugees are completely left out of the story. And so where I see a solution coming in is thinking about embracing movement and embracing refugee choice in that way. I'm happy to talk about more, that more later on. Yeah, so I guess this question maybe gets back to some of the, <clears throat> the discussion earlier about effectiveness, right? Yeah. So it, you list these different tactics that a state can use to, to encourage people to return without refilling, refouling them, whatever the country is. Everybody right? speaks French now. Um, but it seems like certain of these actions are much more difficult than others to do, right? Like I can harass people in a camp, but maybe it's harder for me to, to coordinate other types of things. So do you see kind of variation among states in the global south in kind of what leads to effectiveness? And then related to that, there's also this degree of like collusion that's required, both with another state in the global south, and then also collusion, maybe if you're lucky, right, with the state in the global north that can help you walk through these legal things. So why don't you just talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so on the collusion side of things, I think so return without well, reform, the way that I conceive of it, is a host state strategy. But it's going to be more likely to be successful if the origin state also has an investment in it, right? Um, so we're going to see variation then on um, success in two ways, returning people and returning people without reputational cost, depending on whether they have the sort of country of origin support. So I think that's what we saw in Afghanistan and Pakistan, right? Pakistan did not have the country of origin supporting the return, and they ended up paying a bit more of a reputational cost for the enforced return. Um, even though they were saying these aren't really refugees, these are undocumented migrants and all of this. So I think the other part of this is that truly voluntary return is rare, right? And so this is something I'm currently struggling with in that we're seeing attempted coercion, but not necessarily on the scale of return. We're not seeing 250,000 Burundian refugees return. We're seeing maybe 20,000 Burundian or 60,000 Burundian refugees return. And so I think what I'm trying to find a way to focus on in the broader project or in the paper is to say, like, but that doesn't mean that the rest of those refugees, that the, that the strategy isn't, what, is a, what it is effective at is creating, um, for lack of a better term, precarity, but creating um, these sort of incentives not to stay. Can I answer? Yeah, and I guess and there's like some degree of variation, right? right, among, like, as you brought in this project out, right, some states are going to be better able to, like, harass or, mm. like, create a, a fake legal story or something Yes, like that. yeah, I think that. Right. Suzanne, I got you next in line. Sounds good. Um, 
Okay, I guess, so my first question sort of in, um, uh, two very short questions. First, um, so you talk about the UNHCR as an organization, like sort of wanting to have these particular policies um, because of its relationship with these states. But how does, sort of, why does that individual UNHCR aid worker on the ground actually enforce those policies, right? Like, what would, ha what would happen to that worker if they gave the Burundians cookies when they came to the event? Like, why are they willing to do that? Um, and then my second question is basically, do you see any variation in what Global South countries are doing in terms of either a group policy for recognition or getting rid of the group policy based on state capacity? Is that anything to do with them being able to process migration, or is it simply just about can they absorb the migrants or not? Um, so the question on the second question is like, is this a capacity issue? Just like, is that a variable that matters at all, sort of state capacity? Um, so I think that the initial prima facie recognition is often talked about as an issue of both capacity and efficiency. Um, but Oh, a, a number of other authors like Nora Stell, Kelsey Norman, Lamiz Abdelati have recognized that like capacity is not the driving factor, nor is it the sort of um, deciding factor. And that a lot of these states are saying sort of like using a story of lack of capacity to delegate some like politically tricky decision making to the UN. Um, and kind of set themselves up a bit more strategically for future action with re in relationship to the refugee population. Um, why are individuals willing to not give cookies? Great question. So UNHCR and a lot of humanitarian aid workers on the ground often tell me a story about like the broader protection of human rights and versus the individual action. So. On the cookie story, it's like, well, if we get kicked out of camp, then there's no aid provision, then UNHCR doesn't provide aid to the rest of everybody in camp, right? 10 years ago, or more than 10 now, because I'm older now, <laughs> uh, in 2009, when uh, Tanzania actually did fully orchestrate this cessation, I talked to aid workers who said, well, we got involved to run the buses and drive Burundians who were being beaten out of camps and sent back to Tanzania. We got involved because if we didn't do it, it the, the human rights violations would be worse. There's a real belief in sort of saving so, so the better angels almost, right? Um, and it perpetually affects their decision-making behavior. The individual aid workers. I wouldn't say it's non-cynical, right? The cynical side is that if, if we don't do this, we won't be able to continue X, Y, Z. Or if we don't do this, human rights violations will be much worse. Nilsu. Um, hi, so I, I studied in the Middle East and I have worked with um, Palestinian refugees in Lebanon and Syrians in Turkey. So this comes from a more direct experience perspective. But um, in Turkey, there's an, the government tries to keep the refugees by giving them, for instance, like citizenship. So is, my first question is, is there a space for this in your typology that there are actually governments that try to keep these refugees for political reasons? And then... Yeah. Okay, and then um, the second part of the story is I think there's a societal level story, which I think you're looking more at the coerc coercive state behavior. But in Turkey, for instance, we see a government that is friendly towards refugees, but then a society that is very against that of refugees. And then that kind of, this group interaction forces people to want to go out of Turkey to European countries. And then, for instance, in Lebanon, we have a state that does not even give a status to these refugees. They're called Palestinian refugee in Lebanon. Their passport says that. But then they're not facing as much of a hostility at the societal level. So there's more incentive for them to just be happier with where they are. So I'm curious, how does the societal behavior play into this? Or how does that affect incentives? Yeah, absolutely. Um, on the on the sort of social behavior and, and um, attitudes towards refugees, um, 
yeah, Alex Braithwaite and others have this other paper precisely on this about feeling under pressure, right? Um, and what it means to be in a hostile state. There's also other sort of studies of hostility at the local level towards refugees. And I think it certainly affects it. I also think that it can interact and be guided by the state um, in, in many cases. So a lot of what the Tanzanian government does, for example, is frame Burundians as thieves and criminals who are coming from an undemocratic um, country. We are civilized. We don't have war here. We're, we're Democrats. And they you know, shape public opinion. Public opinion is not just, you know, existing on its own to be against the Burundian refugees. So um, on the one hand, what I'm talking about here is trying to identify the state action and talk about state behavior specifically. Not to say that the social stuff doesn't exist, but sort of that's what I'm focused on in the typology here. I think that it can and often does interact. Um, on the, you know, where does naturalization or offering citizenship um, come in? Um, I think like you can have in this decision to comply, you can provide asylum, you can host refugees, you can provide them with citizenship. In this case, I think in, in the Turkey situation, you have a lot of other diplomatic incentives. If, if Kelly Greenham were, were still in here, we'd be talking about the EU-Turkey deal and how much that sort of citizenship was bought at the behest of the European Union um, and whether that citizenship is, is full citizenship um, with full rights or not. Um, but certainly, it, it exists in the sort of choice set. Um, what I'm interested a bit more in is what happens in how, how, sh how states are able to sort of wiggle out of the compliance. Does that answer some of your questions? Yeah. No, so just to pick up on this, and I'll put you on the spot, but you're our red as in a Turkish expert here, but as Stephanie was saying, it, it, you said the government's sort of favorable and society is not. Is it just that Angela Merkel and the EU, they gave money to Turkey to make sure that they don't, the first strategy that Stephanie is saying, don't get the exactly. refugees even to our territory. And so what's the idea of Turkish citizens that, hey, we're being paid to keep these refugees here? Is this the problem with society and that we're just like a holding place for the refugees and this is illegitimate and the government sees it as this is what we're doing or... Can you say something more about the popular perception of Turkey as the holding point in order for the rich states to do the first strategy? I think in terms of Turkish public stance, it's less so about what the EU does or not, because the common Turkish public does not really follow the EU. Or try to keep up with what's going on in terms of these deals. I think what they're focused on is the idea that these people are being offered citizenship and they're able to go to universities um, without writing the university entrance exam. So where's the equality in that, in terms of versus a Turkish citizen who has to write the exam? And then um, they're getting citizenship and voting for Erdogan, for instance. And then the opposition is really frustrated with this, that they're able to have voting ability. So things are not at the, from the public perception, it is not about what, what the EU is doing. It's about what's happening at the local level and how does that put me at a disadvantage. Okay, Barry. So many questions. Um, first of all, this is... This I, is I heard a, last week Jim was here in my place and he actually was better than I at preventing people from asking. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to Jim, how do you do that? And Jim said the only solution is to shoot the first person. <laughs> <laughs> so, Barry, be careful here. Right? Shooting me is not so easy. <laughs> so uh, this is great. You, you kind of uh, you filled in the boxes on an interesting conceptual variable, the kind that lots of people are starting studying in other areas, as in strategies of proliferation, strategies of counterproliferation, military strategies, national strategies. This is strategies of refugee management. So kudos to you for spelling, for observing this, spelling it out, making it it clear. Um, I guess the the question I'm having as I listen to your talk is like wh where am I standing at any given point in the talk in terms of whether we're viewing this conceptual variable as an independent variable or a dependent variable? What, what are we actually looking for here? And I, I'm not asking that question just to be kind of a political science oh. lead, but because 
even in, I mean, in the world of policy science, we're not just interested in describing the problem. We, we kind of want to know what's causing what, because that's yeah. how we figure out which buttons to push to try and make things better or worse. So some people have asked you questions about um, why do these different strategies work or not work? Mm. But the larger question that I have, which is, is you were implying in, in the motivating question about you know sort of the, the end of asylum or whatever that there is a a long run change in asylum policies so that, that asylum policies are the deep end area. Once upon a time, mm -hmm. there were good, wholesome, nice asylum policies, mm -hmm. and now in both the South and the North. They were kind of ugly, hypocritical, you know, weird, not very nice to the to the mm. actual subjects kind of strategies. And one question that just jumps into my head is, do you have some sense of what was the what were the principal independent variables that have driven what you perceive to be the change in refugee strategies? To get some purchase on this question of are we? Is it this disappearing asymptotically, or is it just, or is it just disappearing? People do this. Thing. My phone rings in my hearing aid, so periodically it's like somebody zapped me. <laughs> <laughs> right? um, so, 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 see my question. I have some hypotheses about why this has happened. Yeah. Right? But I, we, you know, talk right. about some other. I think they're obvious ones. But, but I'm, I'm sort of asking you to tell me a little bit more about what is your standpoint, and to turn this into a larger project. Are you thinking of doing both, right? Yes. What's the IV that has changed the DV? Exactly. And then when you have this variation in the DV, someone's DV is usually someone else's IV. Exactly. That becomes the question of, okay, so which of these strategies are working, under what conditions, who picks yeah. what, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. So I see it as both IV and DV, okay. depending on whose paper I'm reading and I'm not. No, in terms of like, what are some of the principal things externally that have changed a lot of this? I mean, refugee policy fundamentally changed in the Cold War, right? Fall of the Cold War, we have what turned from offering political asylum to uh, communist countries, right? As a sort of like a real value on providing asylum and this PR strategy of like, these people are fleeing terrible places, da, 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 so we want to welcome them. That fundamentally changed the nature of the refugee regime because it was no longer as politically advantageous in the global north, right? And there's lots been lots of studies on that about what's been going on in the global north, right? I think what's what's changing in the global south um, is that in part in part related to that, right? And the insulation of the global north, the global south is bearing sort of hosting most refugees and somewhat you know, indeterminately, right? And they're getting sick of it. There's also a rising populist sentiment, rising xenophobia. So I think all of those things are going on in the background. And okay, they're- So the, to make it clear, you would say, the magnitude of the refugee problem in scope and time, as experienced in the global south, has exploded over the last 30 years. I wouldn't say it's exploded. I would say it, it has not gone down. We're seeing a steady increase in the last 10 years. Um, but what I think is happening is that we have no solution and people are just staying indefinitely. And alongside that, we're having a rising tide of populism and very sort of, um, I mean, it, it, so it's hard to identify completely as an IV, right? Because the strategies in the global north are increasingly visible. Right? So the more states in the global north are increasingly visible in their ways of avoiding refugees, the more states in the global south are going to want to do something the same way. That's on the one hand. But I, I'm, I guess I'm more in, like, interested in like, what is this as an IV or a DV? Which is to say, I think that there's a lot of papers, for example, that are trying to study who returns particularly in Syria, right? So Syria, um, with, with the conflict sort of, or the, the, the violence at least abating, tons of people are interested in who's going to return, what is the in return decision making, and we're, you know, this is really the, you know, the real political scientists, not myself, are interested in that individual micro level decision making, right? And they're looking at what is influencing the choices and who, what type of person is going to choose to return. 
And I would argue that if here we need to think of state policy as affecting that. It's an independent variable affecting that, right? That we cannot think about who returns without thinking about how states are shaping the choice set available, right? On the other hand, it's also an evolution. It's also a dependent variable. It's also evolving. And I think it is, um, th this is the question of like, is policy becoming more liberal over time or is, is it becoming more conservative over time, right? And I think it's, you know, I, I, would, I would argue that what I'm presenting here is trying to capture what that change looks like. And what I'm saying is that the way that they're trying to structure the change is to maintain this sort of fundamental tent pole of non refoulement. Um, and the change then is becoming around the standards and norms being to violate every other right to kind of buy non refoulement at the cost of every other standard of living. And which means you have to explain what the advantage is mm -hmm. of hanging on to non refoulement I can think of several. I'm not going to, I don't want to dominate the airspace here, but it just, you know, you, you, mm -hmm. you were in the first stages of this and you asked us to kind of yeah. help you and yeah. just trying to. No, uh, I. Well, this is raising um, some other things, but Barry was talking about these. Uh, independent variables that might be affecting the refugee norms, but if you, you know, the thing we're doing with our big IIR classes is the system driven by norms or just by state interests. Mm -hmm. And I think about another norm like the right to protect. This was something where it was, looked like it depends responsibility. On what was trying to be so the responsibility to protect, which turned into the right to protect, which has turned into <coughs> something else. But we don't talk about it the way we did 15 years ago when Barry and I were teaching mm -hmm. the military. I don't hear anybody talking about that norm anymore. And I just wonder whether there's something going on at the systemic level that's turning our system into less of a normative order than a lot of it helped and more about the states pursuing their own interests. That's a question beyond, yeah. you know, but it's, you know, what we... we it's not necessarily think. beyond. I mean, you're giving well, up the ghost yeah. too soon. It's, <laughs> so, it's not beyond at all. This is a manifestation. The whole idea about a rules-based order and all of this, I mean, and some of these things, it just seems like there's something going on in our whole system that's changing the whole system with and pushing us more towards transactional, pop, realist, mercenary, whatever you want to say, but against this this normative work. Roger and I are back in our intervention course. You, you've given yeah, us a, yeah. a, a bit of time travel. Here. Well, yeah. I got I got a few questions. Okay. Um, and I've forgotten your name. So blue shirt dude and then orange <laughs> shoe. Okay, so you two go go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, what's your name? Sorry, I Michael. Michael. Yeah. Um, Michael. So I guess my my first question to ask would be about looking, because you, you briefly mentioned the situation um, with Pakistan and, and Afghanistan, and that seems to me like a really interesting counterexample where the, you know, the complete cynic in me says that the, you know, the, the ultimate litmus test of whether or not Nauru Vimala has been, like, completely abandoned is whether or not the first person to sort of step over the line, if the reaction to it is oh, this is bad, versus, oh, thank God somebody else did it first, now we don't have to pay attention to it either, right? And so the case with Pakistan strikes me as interesting because there is a case where it has been violated and the reaction to that violation still seems to be strong. So that actually does strike me as a good example of, no, it is being maintained, even if people want to skirt the edge of it and try to get around it the impetus to completely ignore it isn't there yet. Yeah, I think this comes back a little bit to Eric's question earlier, which is like mm -hmm. the question of how effective these strategies are going to be at evading the norms, right? Like, I think the global north has a lot of advantages in evading non refoulement because of the territori ter territoriality aspect. Different states in the global south are going to have different advantages and how well they're going to be able to avoid being seen as violating non refoulement pa Pakistan still had the strategy of trying to seem like it. It just didn't sell that well. It just wasn't bought that well, right? And I think part of that is because of the host and origin state relationship there. 
What's your name? Edgardo. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for like the presentation. It really, it really did challenge uh, a lot of my understanding of uh, the, the solutions. In fact, I, I was wondering if you can talk more about the, the implications of, of durable solutions, because uh, it seems that it was uh, for a long time that like a settled debate in which uh, uh, return is, is, the, is what we should be doing. And you know, we go to uh, biographies of UN, UN officials and they always want, when they talk about refugees, it's always about like, we need to end this camp. This camp needs to be over. We're working for like ending this. Yeah. Um, you also uh, see, for example, you go to the. I, I have not been in the in the region, but you you go see videos of, of UNHCR of the, like Saturday ref, refugee camp, and uh, they they always show uh, that, that like these clips of like uh, of like uh, like of very like old people who like dream of coming back and like of, of kids saying like I have never been in Syria, but I am a Syrian and I think I belong in this place. Like so, how how is how is that it, it has changed. Uh, from like returning or like it gives the right to return from like such a such uh, like the great thing to do and now as a, as a, as a, as, a, as a refugees being coerced to do uh, in such a way and, like how do you think like uh, the implication of like how do we sh we should we think about durable solutions for refugees? Absolutely. Let's take a few now because we're going to run out of time. Uh, here and then I think in the back, Jim and I saw hand was that you, Charlie? Yeah. So yeah, go ahead, let's do those three and then you'll take the answer. Great, thank you. Um, Stephanie's is a, a great project um, and very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, uh, just quickly, the, 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 point, the discussion about Turkey and Germany raises some interesting questions about how these strategies interact. Um, does, the, does the Global North strategy of non-entree sort of push right, so it pushes into the Global South and then how does that affect those states' decision-making calculus? Mm. Um, I think my question was uh, um, picking up a little bit on, on some of these these, these larger <coughs> questions about you know, how this generalizes and what we can learn from this. So you're you're telling this really interesting story about how normative regimes are, are hollowed out. Mm -hmm. um, so assuming this you know, hollowing out uh, is is a dependent variable of sorts, um, and 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 then your your back and forth would vary about. The causes of hollowing out, right? If these causes are continuing, if they're increasing, then how long would we expect a hollowed out normative regime under those continued pressures to persist? Oh. And that maybe is just asking Kelly's question in a different guise. Um, uh, it's about implications, yeah. but I think that is sort of one of the bigger picture questions um, yeah. I wanted to know. Um, and then very practically on the case study, um, to sort of help rule out these alternative explanations um, or narratives. Um, are the refugees who have returned to Burundi being harassed? I mean, is there concrete evidence that life is actually worse for them now that they're back? Just curious, based on your knowledge of the case. Um, great talk about an important topic. If people are going to do all this work over the years, they should be on a big, important topic that affects them. Uh, two things. It seems to me that the argument hinges on costs, that the states are paying these costs. I, I find it a lot more persuasive if those were specified in greater detail. Mm. Like, how big are these costs, and are they political or economic costs? Who actually bears them? Mm. And then the costs of non-compliance, that they are, the individual decision makers or states are weighing against that same thing. How big, who pays them? That would make it a more persuasive argument. On this debate of the, uh, is it declining and ending, or is it in decline, or what does that mean? It seems to pick up on Roger's question, I don't know anything about this literature, that one way to get at it is a comparative approach that looks at norms decline in other domains, mm -hmm. and to say, does this look more like an apple or more like an orange? Yeah. And I don't know if that exists or not, but yeah. that is another way to get at it. Charlie, last question. Yeah, just briefly, I'm not sure it goes to the core of your analysis, but I, um, you do use norms and sort of international law blur together and then separate out. And it seems like states that at least are vulnerable to pressure follow international law, but it doesn't mean they really respect the norm as a norm. And so I just thought that it might be useful to keep those somewhat separate and explain like, what, what do you actually mean by the norm? And is it state's actual desire to, to do something that's right? Or is it that it's a, that they'll be punished? So there's that very basic, and how does that relate to the international law? Um, and some states, you know, and, and then the whole the idea of like the spirit of a norm, <laughs> which is different. That 
So I just thought that analytically, it, it's useful to separate all those out. I'm not sure it goes to your sort of, you know, to your very nice graph about decisions, but it does go to how you speak about your findings. Mm -hmm. So you would say like the norm is still strong because states' policies are somehow affected by it. But I could have taken your talk and said, no, the norm's not strong, but states strong. are vulnerable to sanctions because the North can impose sanctions by international law, which is different than the norm. And then those stem states themselves can violate the, the spirit of the norm. But then, so all those are sort of, so I just say you, without being too tedious, it's always like when you hear these things, it's like, but I think those types of clarifications would be useful in terms of ex being clear about what your bottom line on the, on the, <coughs> of what's going on. Um, well, maybe I can take these in reversed order. Um, in terms of figuring out what's a norm, what's a law, I, I agree. I, it needs to be better specified. I think the part of the problem is that in in the real world, it isn't always specified, right? So then making that specification analytically becomes um, muddy. Um, and it gets a bit to um, Barry's question as well in terms of what are the incentives. And I think where I want to go with this um, when I sort of make it into a book project is I think we can, you know, sort of in the theoretical incentives of, you know, making sure that you can still get foreign aid, um, making sure that you are not losing reputational costs um, diplomatically, especially with more powerful states are really sort of easy and kind of easy to sketch out on paper. The open question is whether normatively speaking, there is uh, the actors are feeling pressured to not send refugees home as a sense of moral violation. And that's something that, you know, a lot of this project was built on field work on my previous refugee return um, book project. And that's sort of the field work um, question that I still haven't kind of figured out, is the question of whether the spirit of the norm is driving some of that thought process. Um, and which relates to Renana's question about how long does hollowed out stay versus when is this norm gone? Um, and I think the, 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 it's dead, right? When there's not just compliance with it, but there's also not compliance with the idea of it. This is Dixon and um, her co-author, ben, ben Joseph, I think is his last name, um, on sort of like you need to talk about not just whether the, it's legally complied with, but also whether there is concordance around the spirit of the norm as well. And that's something that I don't have as much evidence on. Um, so I think, and it would be hard to find it. Um, we'll see what we can do there for the broader project. Um, in terms, but I do think that um, is sort of important because I think the regime could remain hollow for a very long time. Um, and then in terms of durable solutions, um, oh no, costs first. I agree the costs should be specified. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, uh, uh, yes, I, I take that point and it needs to happen. Um, in terms of uh, durable solutions, most refugees, do refugees want to return? So I think a lot of refugees, particularly a lot of Syrian refugees, because it's a more recent displacement, have articulated that they do want to return, but they want to return when it is safe to do so, right? When we talk about refugee agency, wanting to return and wanting to return now are two different things, right? Wanting to return in theory versus uh, do I feel safe to do so now? That's sort of why we have asylum in the first place. Um, and I think what, where we're getting this evolution, particularly from UNHCR, is basically that states don't want to host refugees indefinitely. And so we're seeing sort of this manipulation, this is Michael Barnett's work, of what constitutes voluntary. And moving away from a refugee's own decision making, calling it subjective, saying, well, you're, you're a subjective actor in this case. Your opinions about what's safe or not is actually not what goes into voluntariness. What's objective is the state's assessment of whether or not it is safe for you to return. That's objective. And so creating this concept and the Barnett traces of voluntariness, right? That can then be, you can still have, you, you can have this outcome where you see UNHCR promoting voluntary return, right? But it's actually return in voluntariness. <laughs>
right? Return when we've objectively assessed that it is safe enough for refugees to return. Um, and in Burundi, are they safe to return? Some are, are finding their houses occupied um, and coming into conflict at the local level. Um, some are able to return um, and are, so, so, so it, it's, a, we got variation. Um, some are being thrown into prison. In Syria, this is particularly evident, right? So people who are returning to Syria are just being like immediately surveilled by the state. Um, and uh, many of them um, uh, disappeared and, and things like this. Okay, so I just wanna make one last comment. And that's, you know, I always judge the relevancy and importance of a topic. And there was a, uh, a Ted Lasso episode where the boat is off the English shore <laughs> yeah. and the English prime minister won't let it land because they'll have to do treat them as refugees. And the African players on the team use their normative pressure to get their other teammates to protest against this policy. So if, if there is a Ted Lasso uh, measure of relevance, you you certainly yes. passed it there. So thank let's thank our speakers. Sir.